Tonight we conclude our lecture series of the Virgin Mary, her life. After receiving that wonderful message from the Archangel Gabriel on that fateful Friday, such as today, Mary went home, swept her house, made her bed, washed herself, dressed up like a queen, called her friends together and awaited the descent of her son. She gave her two dresses to two poor widows and showed to all the prize given her by the Archangel Gabriel, a palm branch from paradise. The first wish of Mary after the angelic message was to see the apostles in order so she can bid them farewell. She asked her son the favor to gather them around her and miraculously they all arrived from all parts of the city and the world to be by her side. John came from Ephesus. Peter came from Rome. Paul came from Tiberia, a city near Rome. Thomas from India. Mark from Alexandria. Matthew was on a ship that came all the way. <clears throat> Excuse me, Matthew was on a ship that was tossed away back and forth on the waves. And Bartholomew came from Egypt. Luke, Simon, the Canaanite, and Thaddeus came back from the dead. And James was already in Jerusalem. All were very happy to be with her and each related to her where he was and what they were doing with their lives when they were picked up by a cloud and brought to her home. Now we remember a lot of this comes again from the Apocrypha. It was now Sunday. All the apostles and all the people gathered around her. And the Virgin lay on her bed saying farewell. And as she said farewell, she was blessing everybody. Then she lifted up her hands and said, Be it unto me immediately, according to your word. And she gave her spirit into the hands of her son who came down in glory. Things began to move and voices and noises and sharp sounds were heard throughout the house. The face of the Theotokos shone like the sun in a great fragrance and a brilliant light filled the whole house. And then the chief among the apostles, who was Peter, and then John, Paul, and Thomas, came forward and embraced and kissed her sacred feet. Peter presided over the funeral procession. A legend has it that the Lord, who had come down to receive his mother's soul, told Peter, the time has come, the time has come to begin the chanting. Whereupon Peter invited Paul to say the prayer. But Paul declined in deference to Peter. But Peter asked Paul again. But Paul referred to Peter who finally said the prayer. And the funeral bier was carried by Peter and John at the head and James and Paul at the feet. All the others were following and chanting the funeral hymns and sensi. Thus was the body carried from Zion to Gethsemane for her burial. 
John was also carrying the palm branch, which was given to her from paradise. Peter and the rest of the apostles were chanting the Psalm 113, when Israel went forth from Egypt, and while the heavenly powers responded with Alleluia. The funeral procession, as they were making their way down the street, was disturbed by an, by an impious Jew by the name of Jephonia. In other versions, he's mentioned as Athonius. He was a very strong man, and he rushed at the procession, trying to knock the bearer over and off the shoulders of the apostles. But out of nowhere, an invisible angel came, cut off his hands with a fiery sword, and suspended them in the air by the bearer. At the sight of this miracle, all the Jews following the procession of the funeral of the Theotokos cried out, Indeed, the one born from you, Theotokos, ever Virgin Mary, is the Son of God. And as for this man, Jophania himself, at the call of Peter, he approached the bear to see the wonders of God. And standing behind the bear, he cried out, Holy Mother Mary, who bore Christ our God, have mercy on me. Then Peter said to him, In the name of the one who was born from her, let your hands be attached back to your body. And right away his hands were reattached to his arms, and he believed and he glorified God. Again, According to legend, Jephonia became an evangelist and taking the branch from John's hand, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, where by placing the branch over the eyes of those who were spiritually blind, brought them within the Christian fold. Now when we talk about the place of the Virgin's burial, according to universal testimony, the body of the Theotokos was buried in a tomb in the Garden of Gethsemane, east of Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley. Saint Yermanos writes that the body was placed in her tomb with a linen cloth upon the body, leaving her hands uncovered. The whole story of the remission is centered in the three lines of a most famous hymn. All apostles gather here from the ends of the earth and bury my body in the village of Gethsemane. And you, my son, my God, Receive my spirit. And now the question is, what happened to the body of the Theotokos? And there's three versions. What happened to the body which the apostles brought from Zion to Gethsemane for burial? There are three answers which vary between each one. Yet, all have a common point, and that is an empty tomb. And we'll look at each one. The simplest is that of Saint Yermanos. According to this version, the chief among the apostles, Peter and Paul, grasping the two ends of the sheet, that were overhanging on either side of the bear, lifted up the body without touching it, and placed it in the tomb. No sooner 
had they let it go, then the body was snatched up out of the sheet. Nobody could see the body being snatched because it was the invisible God who did it. And the sheep, like a speedy cloud, was speedily fluttering in the hands of the apostles with no body in it. What is peculiar, what is peculiar about this story is that it overlooks the absence of St. Thomas, the apostle. In the same way that Theodore the Studite and the great Synexadion overlook it. Not only that, but the latter of the two has Thomas coming on a cloud to the other apostles and embracing the feet of the deceased Mary. The second version is more complicated as it comes out of the mouth of Juvenal. During the reign of Marcion in the year 450 to 457, Queen Bulgaria, who had built the church of the Theotokos in Blacherna in Constantinople, wanted to lay the relics of the Theotokos in it, taking advantage of the presence of Archbishop Juvenal of Jerusalem. The Juvenal of Jerusalem at the Fourth Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon, which took place in 451 AD. She called him to the capital city because Chalcedon was not too far from Constantinople. And she called him to help her find the relics. And Juvenal related to her the following story. Holy Scripture does not relate anything about the death of the mother of God, Mary. However, from ancient and true tradition, we learn that at the different time of her passing, that the holy apostles were preaching in different parts of the world in a flash of time. And through the year, were transported to Jerusalem. And her God-receiving body was buried in the Garden of Gethsemane, where the angelic presence in him chanted, chanting lasted for three days. After the third day, when the singing had stopped, one of the apostles, Thomas, who was left out of the burial, but came on the third day, wanted to see and reverence the body. So the apostles opened the tomb, but did not find the body of the Virgin Mary, but only the shrouds. And being overcome by the unspeakable fragrance, they closed the tomb. Astonished by the miracle, they entertained only one thought, that the one who was incarnate and became man through her and preserved her virginity, even after her birth, was pleased to take up her undefiled body before the general resurrection. Present along with the apostles were the most honorable Timothy, the apostle and first bishop of, Ephes of the Ephesians, and Dionysius, the Ayurid, as he himself testifies in his homilies about the blessed Herothios, who was also present. And after hearing this story, Bulgaria requested that she be given at least the clothes that were found in the tomb, which she did, which she did deposit in the church of Blacherne. Is this story true? Does it constitute a popular legend, an imitation of the feeling of Jesus by Thomas? The fact that the Damascan, who is a strict researcher of the truth, 
accepts the story and gives it a degree of credibility. Yet, there are still many questions and questionable statements, the least of which is the homily referred to by the story of Saint Dionysio the Iogeniti, which is not by the Saint Dionysius, who was converted by Saint Paul, but by the same name, who lived in the fifth century, or by another Dionysius of Alexandria, who lived in the third century. But now we have a third version of this version of the Dormition. And this comes from the Synaxarion attributed to the pseudo Joseph. Once the reader takes into consideration that he, the Synaxa, that he, the Synaxaria, is the poetry of the pious and the poetry likes to speak in metaphors, let him accept all these versions not as fact, but as writings, full of humble teachings, with tears and chants, the apostles placed the body of the Virgin Mary in the tomb with great honors. When a light flashed about them and they fell to the ground, because an angel of the Lord came down and took the holy body to heaven. And the blessed Thomas, who had not as yet come when she had passed away, was suddenly transported to the Mount of Olives from where he viewed the body being carried to heaven. And he started calling out, O oh, Holy Mother, O oh, pure mother, O oh, blessed mother, if I found favor with you and, I, and was found worthy to see you, look down kindly upon me, your petitioner, and make me rejoice as you go to heaven. And then the belt of the Theotokos, which the apostles had girded the body was dropped down to the blessed Thomas and he grasped it and worshiped and thanked God and went down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. We found the apostles fallen on their faces because of the sudden glory that shone upon them. And Peter said to Thomas, Thomas, you have always been a rough man. For this reason, you were not found worthy to be around. When God came, you weren't worthy to be present with us for the funeral of the mother, the Savior, because of your known unfaithfulness. Yes, said Thomas, beating his chest. I was always bad and faithless. I know it, and I beg of you to forgive me. The apostles prayed for Thomas, and after the prayer, he asked them where the body was. And they pointed to the tomb, but Thomas told them that the body was not there. Peter rebuffed him and told him that this was not the first time that he had shocked and shown lack of faith and so forth. Because we remember he has done this before when our Lord rose from the dead at his resurrection. And Thomas insisted that the body was not there. And whereupon the apostles in anger went to the tomb, opened it, 
saw it with their own eyes that the body was not there and begged Thomas for forgiveness. Then he related to them how he was celebrating the divine liturgy in India and he was picked up by a cloud and was brought to the Mount of Olives and how he saw the Virgin being carried up into heaven. And as she was being carried up, he prayed to her. He forgave them for the way they treated him. He blessed them and he sealed the blessings with the following. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And that little saying is from Psalm 133. These are the stories concerning the body of Mary after her death. Are they true? The Roman Catholic Church made it a dogma in 1955 that the body of the Virgin Mary was assumed in the heaven after death. The Orthodox Church does not accept this as a dogma, but rather as a pious belief that the Mother of God was indeed taken up to heaven to become the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead among the mortals out of respect and reverence and recognition of her contribution to the work of salvation. We see in the icon of your mission, our Lord holding in his hands a baby. And that baby is the soul of the Virgin Mary. What we strongly believe about the role of the Virgin Mary in heaven is that she continues her exalted mission of praying to Almighty God for our salvation. That is her role in heaven. Her role is the same here on earth. It's her intercessions. There is no doubt that there has always been accesses in how people recognize the Mother of God, the Virgin Mary. They will continue to exist as long as there exists ignorance among the believers. Regardless of these accesses, However, we the Orthodox will always love, respect, and revere the Theotokos, not as the Lord, but the servant of the Lord. Not as the king, but as the throne of the king. Not as the self-lighting sun, but as the moon which reflects the sun. Not as a fountain, but as the spigot. Not as the bank, but as the bridge that connects one side over the stream to the other side is the bridge. Not the one who saves, but the one who leads us to the Savior. An example, again, is the miracle of Cana in Galilee. She sees the groom and his party is in distress because they lack wine. And she hastens to their help. However, she does not become the center of the activity herself, but she turns to her son with the famous plea, they have no wine, and receives a remedy from her, from him. She does 
She does not tell the servants, I order you, but rather she says, do whatever he tells you to do. The key is she tells them whatever he tells you to do. Because salvation and glory belong to God alone. Next to our Lord Jesus Christ, the name Mary appears in most of our church hymns. In the Divine Liturgy, she is mentioned in every petition with three words, remembering our most holy, pure, blessed, and glorious Lady, Theotokos, and ever Virgin Mary, with all the saints. Let us commit ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. Then we ask her to intercede for us by the intercessions of the Theotokos, Savior, save us. Then in relating the story of the Son, we say, O only begotten Son and Word of God, being mortal, you humbled yourself for our salvation, taking flesh by the Holy Theotokos, and ever Virgin Mary, and without change became man. Then we refer to her in the birth of the Savior in the Creed, who for us men and for our salvation came down from the heavens, who was incarnated by the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary, and became man. Then, after the consecration, we refer to her. Again, we offer to you these re re we offer to you this reasonable worship for those departed in faith, forefathers, fathers, patriarchs, prophets, especially for our most holy, pure, blessed, and glorious lady, the Theotokos, and ever Virgin Mary. And we chant to her, it is truly and right to bless you, Theotokos, and ever Virgin Mary, most pure mother of God, more honorable than the cherubim, and more comparable and glorious than the seraphim. Without corruption, you gave birth to God. To the word of true Theotokos, we magnify you. And finally, in the, in the dismissal, again we mention Mary. When we say, Lord, you, O God, our hope, Lord, you, may Christ our true God, and then we say, through the intercessions of his most pure and holy mother. And what can we say about the beautiful poem to the Theotokos, which we chant on the first five Fridays of Great and Holy Lent, known as the Salutations to the Virgin of the Activist Hymn, which is dedicated to her entirely. And what about the Paraklisi service, which we chant to her? You would really need volumes to write all the hymns that are dedicated to the Virgin Mary. But I will list just a few relating to her feast days. First is her birth on September 8th. Your nativity of Theotokos was brought joy, or has brought joy to all of the Earth's habitats. Because from you, you have shown forth the Son of Righteousness, Christ Jesus our God. And having loosened the curse from us, he gave a blessing and abolished the power of death and bestowed heaven upon us, O eternal life. And then we have the presentation of the Lord on February 2nd. Rejoice, O full of grace, virgin Theotokos, because from you has risen the only Son of justice, Christ our God. 
lighting those in darkness. Rejoice as well, O elder righteous, having received in your arms the deliverer of our souls, who grants also resurrection to us. Then we have the Annunciation in March 25th. Today the fountainhead of our salvation and the revelation of the mystery planned from eternity. The Son of God becomes man from the Virgin and Gabriel announces the good news of this grace for which let us all cry to the Theotokos, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And tomorrow, as we chant on the eve of her dormition, in giving birth, you preserved your virginity. At your death, you forsook, you forsook not the world, O Theotokos. To life you have passed on, being the mother of life itself, and redeeming through your intercessions our souls from the clutches of death. And we continue to chant the Theotokos, who is insistent and in her intercessions, is immovable hope in her protection whom and the state of death could not retain for being the mother of life to the life he carried over the one who dwelled in the womb O heavenly virgin and at Christmas we hear the virgin bears today this the one above all being and the earth a humble cave to the approachable offers. Angels along with shepherds to God give glory. Wise men with a star make their journey. For unto us is born today a new child, the pre-eternal God. Today the virgin comes onto the cave to give birth inevitably to the world, to the word pre-eternal. Hearing this, be of good cheer, O earth and its people. Him glorify with the angels and the shepherds. Who will manifest a young child, the preternal God? O protection of the Christians, most confident mediation of the Creator, unchangeable. Despise not the pleading voice of those in sin, but hasten, O good one, to the help of all of us in faith who cry out to you. Speed up your intercessions and press on your supplication. O Theotokos, who protects all those who honor you. And to close this lecture series, I leave you with one of the most beautiful hymns composed by the Orthodox Church. In Parthenias Geto e perlam bron totis agnia su gabriel cataplagias evoa si serotoke. Bio si engomion prosagago e paxio. Tide uno maso se aporo que exista me. Diolos prosetagi bosi quere e chari to mani. All by the beauty of your virginity and dazzling brilliance of your purity. The bewildered Gabriel cried to you, O Theotokos, what fitting appellation shall I address to you? And what shall I name you? I wonder in amazement. Therefore, 
as commanded, I cry out to you, Rejoice, O full of grace. Amen. On behalf of myself and the parish of Panagia, I extend to you an early Ekranya Polat, those who will celebrate their feast day this weekend. I extend you an invitation to join us tomorrow evening with the Vespers at six o'clock and Divine Liturgy on Sunday morning beginning at 8.30 with the Orthros followed by the Divine Liturgy. Again, Kronia Polal to all those who celebrate this great feast of the Dormition and may your intercessions always hear our prayer and may they be quick to her son's ears on, our, her, on her behalf. Amen.